the Andes Mountains only a few miles away, Santiago, capital of Chile, has a spectacular setting. The Spanish conquistadores founded the city over 400 years ago. Many magnificent old government buildings show its historic past. But it is also a city of fine new buildings, of handsome plazas and parks, of wide and attractive boulevards. Growing each year in size and importance, Santiago's population approaches the million mark, fourth largest in South America and the principal city on the west coast. Santiago is a real metropolis, buying and selling goods from all over the world. Perhaps what most impresses the newcomer is the modern architecture. Here, for example, is a splendid new hospital with the most up-to-date medical equipment. This is a large housing unit that would excite admiration anywhere for its simplicity in design. The government has recently built many such projects. In public housing, Chile is one of the most advanced countries in Latin America. Like large cities everywhere, Santiago had and still has its slums. Probably one-third of the nation used to live in such adobe tenements. Here, with living conditions almost as bad as some in Washington or Charleston alleyways, disease and death rates mounted. For a time, Chile's infant mortality rate was dangerously high. With only the most primitive facilities for heating and cooking, without plumbing, with five or six persons crowded into a single room, with people too poor to buy screens or sufficient food, disease spread rapidly. In Santiago, tuberculosis alone claimed thousands of victims each year. But clinics for the treatment of tuberculosis have been set up by the Ministry of Public Health. At these free government clinics, and at others organized by various social security agencies, Staffs of well-trained doctors and nurses are being developed. Chile's public health budget of 232 million pesos for 1942 was nearly twice as large as in 1938. But clinics and sanitariums are still overcrowded with patients from areas where there is inadequate housing. To understand what Santiago and Chile have been doing to meet their housing situation, we are going to spend some time with a typical Chilean family. In the heart of Santiago, in a modern peluqueria or barber shop, we see the father, Manuel Blanco, at work. Later, we shall meet his wife, Teresa, and their three children. On a Saturday, the barber receives his weekly pay, less a deduction for social security due. His stamp book shows his income and ensures him unemployment and medical benefits. His weekly payments will in time provide an old age pension. Manuel Blanco has a long trip to the slum neighborhood where he and his family are forced to live because of the serious housing shortage in Santiago. Like many others who have not yet been cared for, he still lives in a dilapidated adobe tenement or condentillo. His wife tries to make the best of their bad condition. She often says, after all, others are worse off than we are. Perhaps we should be glad to have a roof overhead. But the barber comes home tired discouraged and unhappy. This is no place to try to raise a family, he tells his wife.
Even his two lively daughters, Juanita and Dolores, failed to cheer him up. And he is disturbed to learn that his son, Patricio, the apple of his eye, has not been well and has been in the house all day. While talking with his son, the father becomes more depressed. At the Caja de la Habitación Popular, or Government Housing Bureau, Senor and Senora Blanco fill out an application for admission to one of the many units being built in Santiago. But applications for new living quarters are not automatically approved. First, a social worker from the Bureau investigates the Blancos and their present house. Only those living in substandard dwellings are eligible for admission, and the family income must be high enough to make the small monthly payments required to buy the new home. board passes on all applications. A family entering a housing unit is on probation for one year. After proving desirable tenants, the family becomes owner of the new apartment, subject to a 20-year mortgage. It is one of the happiest days of the Blancos' lives when they learn that they have been accepted as tenants in a government unit. The Blancos spend a day looking over a housing unit under construction. They discuss the relative merits of bungalow and two-story dwellings. The housing board prides itself on the variety of homes to be found in its project. The Blancos have been assigned to a two-story house, and they see its duplicate being built. Here are the plans. Five years, Chile has spent 150 million pesos to build new housing units for more than 8,000 families. A long time has elapsed since the Blancos first applied for new housing, but at last, moving day arrives. From their crowded, dark little house, they move to a fine new home at Poblacion Viva Seca. One of the first nights in their new home, a neighboring couple joins in a housewarming. They dance their version of the Quaker, the Chilean national dance. Let us spend a typical morning with the family. In their new home, 
the Blancos probably represent fairly well about one-third of Chile's million families. A small group in Chilean society, perhaps 10,000 wealthy families, live in much better circumstances. But the majority of Chile's families probably do not live as well as the Blancos in their new surroundings. Chilean nutrition experts would like their countrymen to eat twice as much meat and four times as much milk products as they do now. This, with their present adequate supply of bread, potatoes, vegetables, fruits and sugar, would give them a more satisfactory diet. Senora Blanco and the girls may, if they like, shop at the little store which is in one corner of their housing development. But for fresh vegetables, she patronizes the outdoor market in the nearby park. An invitation to a birthday party is as welcome in Spanish as it is in English. morning, Patricio had slept late. He is called by friends who suggest a swim in the nearby Carabinero pool.
Manuel Blanco's favorite game is El Teso, pitching metal disc at a line. At a little garden club, he matches skill with a few friends. The men may discuss politics between plays. They are outspoken in their opinions, for Chileans are firm believers in free speech and the right of every man, even the most radical, to be heard. After the game, the Blancos eat a picnic dinner. As we see the family eating together, we can be sure that thanks to their new home, their future life can be one of health and happiness. The Blanco family offers a good example of how Chile is solving its housing problem. The tenements are gradually disappearing, in spite of many obstacles, such as lack of money and a tendency to keep to the old ways. The lower income groups, once badly housed, clerks, street peddlers, cooks, day laborers, are slowly but surely receiving better housing. Chile's housing program is getting started all over the country. In dozens of other cities besides Santiago, large housing projects are being built. Some of the new units are of the most simple type. Others are of much more elaborate architecture. But all are designed for the workers of Chile so that they may have space, light, and air. Good housing, Chile believes, is a permanent social investment. It pays dividends in healthier and happier people. <laughs>